I know that you're studying the history of the period. So what I wanted to do is to kind of show you, in a sense, how the literature um, connects to certain events and also leads us forward to a really important place in our country's uh, cultural origins. Uh, so just to think about, you know, between 1789 and roughly 1850, which is where I'm going to take you in this lecture, um, when you think about what came prior, uh, when you think about the, the foundings of the, of the country in terms of its Puritan past, I think you see an interesting trajectory um, into what I feel is, is probably the most important period, and that's the period between 1850 and 1861, the lead up to the Civil War. Uh, but a lot of kind of the, 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 the steps are kind of laid in advance in the period that you're about to see. So when we start to think about this period, which you can kind of term either neoclassicism or the age of reason, um, you often have to put that into connection with the Puritan past, right? This idea that, you know, when the Puritans came to settle the country, uh, they considered it an errand into the wilderness, that they were coming here, in essence, to create a new Jerusalem, right, to find religious freedom and toleration. And a lot of the metaphors that you see coming out of that period relate to this uh, notion that America will eventually be this city upon a hill, that it'll be kind of a light, in a, a beacon of light in a, in a swirling darkness. Now, I think the, the writings that occur in this period are enormously influential and perhaps kind of become ingrained into our sense of the national identity, perhaps without even us even realizing it. But it comes at a period where the, the writers here are beginning to distance themselves from the religious foundings and, of course, the battles that you know took place, cultural battles between, say, Native Americans, uh, Puritan settlement, and, of course, the, the, you know, the, the present problem that will plague the country up until the Civil War, and that's the, the issue of slavery. Um, what you're going to see in this lecture is we're going to talk a little bit about some of the, the more popular works, uh, but I'm going to do so with a couple of visuals to give you context of why these works are important. Um, the first one that I'm going to talk about is someone that you know probably pretty well. And I would, if I'm going to make the argument, the most important work of American literature, in my opinion, in the early part of your course, uh, is Ben Franklin's autobiography. Um, and it, because it becomes, in a sense, part of our national myth. Remember when you have the American Revolution, remember what it's founded, the principles of where it is founded. They're making a, a major change in terms of how they're going to approach this democracy. Right? And one of the things that they're founding this on is this notion that reason must guide everything, right? So in, instead of being kind of divinely oriented that, you know, God has given his will that you're supposed to kind of, you know, follow God's path, there's a turn towards individualism, right? There's also the sense of something that I think is still important to this day. Uh, Franklin is one of the first people to really kind of uh, embrace the notion of the self-made man, right? That if you come from anywhere, all right, you can make something of yourself if you have hard work, if you know what you have to do, and you kind of set forward you know, your, um, your life into kind of perfecting yourself. Now, the reason why I think that's so important is the autobiography's context is that he writes this story to his son who is a British loyalist. Right? And he's writing it, and when you think about autobiography, we often think, well, this is the, the true tale of someone's life. We have to take Franklin's narrative with a little bit of a grain of salt. He gets things wrong. Sometimes things are out of place. And the first thing that I'm going to show you, I think, contextualizes the work that I want you to, the way I want you to think about it. So I wanted to show you, this is a portrait of Ben Franklin by David Martin in 1766. Right? Think about what it shows you here. I mean, this is Franklin in classic Enlightenment pose. He is educated. He is looking at some writings. Here is a bust, maybe of you know, of Cicero, of of Roman oratory. So he he wants to make sure in this portrait that he's showing you to be a man um, who embraces and the Enlightenment philosophy of perfectibility. Right? If you use reason and you use the tools in front of you, you can become an intellectual. You can rise to great things. All of the works that we're going to cover have a little bit of a chip on their shoulder. Because remember, the country is new, right? Many people don't think it will last. 
right? It's an experiment that oftentimes people think this is destined for failure. But you have to recall that the writers, the first two writers we're going to take a look at, both, both of whom are, are fairly familiar names, Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson, signers of the Declaration, also affirmed deists. Right. So the deists, the, the easiest metaphor to think about about a deist God is that God exists, no question, but God is a clockmaker. God has set it in motion, but then it's human beings who are in charge of making sure it works. Now, think about what this portrait entails. Right? He wants to make sure that he has classical learning. Europeans felt that everything in America was backwards, degenerative, right? not worthy of anyone's attention. This was a backwater post. Things just went there to kind of like, you know, kind of downgrade into, into failure. And that's, in a sense, how Americans responded to European, you know, kind of like thoughts about not only progress, but also scientific progress. So keep this one in mind. You have a good, clear picture of what he would like this portrait to represent, right? Someone who is classically learned. Now, just think about that and put it in comparison with this. What's the distinction? This is 10 years later. What's, what's happened exactly. here? Yeah. I mean, he, here's a man who you clearly understand he knows audience, right? He knows what he wants to do when he wants to do it. The first portrait is, I, I want to show people that we are just as learned and we can have just as talented here, perhaps more so, right? In this portrait, this is done in France during the Revolution, putting two and two together. I want to put on our raccoon skin cap. I'm going to put my shabbier clothes on. I want to look like a frontiersman. I want to look like someone who is play acting what an American looks like to the French. Uh, why is he in France? Well, yeah, he's an ambassador. He's asking for assistance. Um, some also would, might want to say that he was uh, perhaps um, hedging his bets a little bit because after all, if you don't know what the outcome of the revolution is going to be, maybe you don't want to be there if they lose. Maybe you'd rather be in France. Right? Just saying. Right? So this is a man who knows the audience, right? And he knows what he wants to put on for the particular people that he's, that he's going to reach. And the autobiography is very much like this. Right? Here's a man who's reflecting on his life and giving you a how to succeed. Right? Some of the images have become part of our kind of, you know, you know uh, our historiography. The idea that he walks into the city of Boston, he's been cast out by his family, he's carrying all his possessions in the world, and he's contemplating how he spends his pennies for a roll of bread and a drink of water. Right? It's, it's become mythologized, right? And it's very deliberate because it gives that sense of, well, you two could be cast out. You two might have to work for things on your own. You might have to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And part of the autobiography, I would suggest, is a self-portrait. I want to paint you a picture that gives you this image of someone who is self-reliant, individualistic, and most importantly, autonomous. You don't need anyone to succeed but your own mind and your own reason. So when you start looking at the autobiography, I think this is important. This is someone who liked to shape shift with what the times needed. One of the most famous parts of the autobiography, and people ate this up, was that he listed a kind of what he called you know, this, this, this chart from moral perfection. This notion that, hey, early on, if you pay attention to yourself and you kind of treat your life as a guidebook, you follow these morals, you can aid in your elevation to a higher state. Right? Think about reading these. One, temperance, eat not to dullness, drink not to elevation, silence, speak not when may benefit others or yourself, avoid trifling conversation, order, let all your things have their places, let each part of your business have its time, resolution, resolve to perform what you ought, perform without fail what you resolve. Frugality, make no expense, but to do good to others or yourself, waste nothing. Industry, lose no time, be always employed in something useful, cut off all unnecessary actions. Sincerity, use no hurtful deceit, think innocently and justly, and if you speak, speak accordingly. Justice, wrong none by doing injuries or omitting the benefits that are your duty. 
moderation, avoid extremes, forbear resenting injuries so much as you think they deserve, cleanliness, tolerate no uncleanliness in body, clothes, or habitation, tranquility, be not disturbed at trifles or at accidents common or unavoidable, chastity, rarely use venery, but for health or offspring, never to dullness, weakness, or the injury of your own or another's peace or reputation, 13, humility, imitate Jesus and Socrates. Now, at the very end, I think you get a sense of the, the comic Franklin, obviously, right? Uh, chastity, rarely use venery. You know, don't sleep around too much, except for offspring. You know. uh, humility, yeah, 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 Im imitate Jesus and Socrates. However, a modern audience reading this honestly took it to heart, right? Follow the checklist. Perfect the self. It's all up to you. You don't have to worry about God. You don't have to worry about others. You need to worry about yourself. And part of what the autobiography was interested in doing was to create a sense where you didn't need other people. It kind of falls into an interesting tradition in literature. You know, if any of you have ever read Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe, right? Stranded on an island, fearing for his life. He's fearing that he's going to be taken over. And what does he do? He gives himself up to God, and he figures out how to create a society, right? Franklin does something similar. It has a kind of sense of a spiritual autobiography, except God is put to the sideline and it becomes more about your control of your own life, period, right? You don't need anyone else. If you follow this, you can go places. And yet, there is a darker current to this, right? Think about a self isolated and apart completely from others, right? Kind of totally autonomous. Here's a, a case in point from the autobiography which very slyly kind of escapes people's attention. Now, remember, Franklin is a printer, right? He's a newspaper person. He's creating identities all the time, planting newspaper pieces, kind of, you know, creating, you know, questions in people's minds. And he often has this ability to create a public persona in print. He's using the technology of the day to his own advantage, right? Something that we take for granted. Newspapers are the means to get a message across and to kind of make sure that your message gets kind of accepted. Now, he's also someone that realizes, as he's making his way in the world, he's needed to rely on other people, right? He's needed to rely. There's a particular point in this section of text where he's describing his relationship with this printer, Kaimar, and his indebtedness to him. But there's also a sense that he doesn't want to be mentored or be in debt to anyone. And then all of a sudden, there's this weird kind of text which we'll read, and I'll kind of unpack it for you. So he's describing his relationship to this you know, mentor. And then he says, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I forgot to mention this incident that occurred off Block Island. And this is what he said. The, the context is he's on a ship, and he's resolved to be a vegetarian at that moment. You know, all of a sudden, you get this description. Hitherto I had struck my resolution of not eating animal food, and on this occasion I considered with my master Tryon the taking of every fish as a kind of unprovoked murder, since none of them had or ever could do us any injury that might justify the slaughter. All this seemed very reasonable, but I had formerly been a great lover of fish, and when this came out hot out of the frying pan, it smelt admirably well. I balanced some time between principle and inclination till I recollected that when the fish were opened, I saw smaller fish taken out of their stomachs. Then thought I, if you eat one another, I don't see why we may eat you. So I dined upon cod very heartily and continued to eat with other people, returning only now and then occasionally to a vegetable diet. So convenient a thing it is to be a reasonable creature, since it enables one to find or make a reason for everything one has a mind to do. That last line is very important. Because think about if he's discussing a mentorship that he's unsat not satisfied with, and then he gives you this side note about, well, I didn't eat fish, but then I realized that the fish eat, eat each other. Then I can be inclined to follow my inclination and eat them. The subtext, I believe, is he's actually saying to you here, I may be inclined to take out that person. My reason gives me a mind to do so. Right? Do I have to be indebted to this person that's training me, or do I become the bigger fish and eat my competition? All right? Here is you know, Franklin's kind of, in a sense, the genius. Right? And also, too, like the kind of wink here. 
how convenient it is to be a reasonable creature because it gives you a mind to do whatever you like to do. I don't have a moral obligation to others. My obligation is myself, period. Right? So in a sense, what you see in the autobiography is continually coming back to this sense of using the public space to create your own sense of self and you're kind of separating you from the crowd. Now, this may seem like a very odd portrait. Um, it is. But it is, in a way, when you pair what Franklin was attempting to do in the autobiography with our third president, Thomas Jefferson, I think you get a sense of some of the, the, the kind of the overarching intellectual traditions at work here. So besides being the third president, right, founding the University of Virginia, uh, creating uh, articles about separation between church and state, uh, um, Jefferson wrote a very important work called The Notes on the State of Virginia. All right? It's a work that is very dense with figures and with calculations. And as this suggests, um, natural history in early America was very important politically. If Franklin was concerned with the creation of a public self and your control over what people see about you, right, almost like a work of art, Jefferson wanted to use science and natural history to create a mastery over nature. Remember, if you think about what the nation has that's unique from Europe, what does it have? The natural world, right? In an enlightenment sense, if you can control the natural world, you can exert your political control as well. Many of you I know beforehand, this is the same period of time that you saw when you were looking at you know, the uh, Lewis and Clark heading out to the West. And part of not only finding the West, but was to collect natural historical examples, specimens. It was very important in this period of time. What's interesting about this is that part of what Jefferson was responding to was also similar to Franklin. He was responding to this kind of charge by Count Buffon in France that natural specimens here degenerated, even human beings. So Notes on the State of Virginia is an attempt to kind of buttress this idea that no, this isn't true. Not only does the species of, of nature not degenerate, they actually expand. He actually sent a moose from New Hampshire, uh, packaged up the skeleton bones over to Buffon to kind of prove to him, hey, things are bigger and larger here than they are there. Right? But the subtext of the note, on notes of the state of Virginia has a darker history because not only is it meant to control the natural world, right? if you can map it and understand it, name it, you can control it. It's kind of like taxonomy. But you can also then begin to say, well, who is at the top of that chain? The intellectuals are at the top, and they can decide, well, who is inferior? I mean, one of the most interesting parts of Notice State of the Virginia is Jefferson speculating about whether or not a society like the United States can exist with racial, racial diversity, and actually speculating the idea that maybe perhaps sending people, uh, Afri you know, African Americans, back to Liberia would be beneficial for the harmony of the nation. So there's a lot of tie-in here in the early part of this period with you know, enlightenment thinking, the control of the self, and then the control of the environment. All of these things are going to be challenged as we make our way through the course. Right? Because in a sense, what these two writers set up, and this is, a, this is a kind of famous, I'm going to show you a little. They set up this kind of idea that, hey, if you, if you have a sense of your mission, right, which is to control the natural world, that may lead you to greater heights. Um, I mentioned Charles Wilson Peel because this is, in a way, shows you just how much natural history was a part of the consciousness of the leaders. This is the period of time. Peel is the first person to create a museum in the United States, right? Uh, he does this in Philadelphia. So it's a period in time where if you love the Natural History Museum, not only just Night at the Museum, this is where it comes from. And think about what happens when you go to these places. Right? You're able to categorize and put things into box and name them. By naming them, you kind of master them. Right? This painting, though, for me, at least shows you maybe some of the fraud of it. Right? So here is this natural historian, painter, enlightenment thinker, 
And this painting from 1822 almost suggests a showman unveiling the curtain. Maybe it's not all it's cracked up to be, right? Maybe there are flaws to the thinking, right? Maybe all this kind of scientific endeavor to map the natural world, put things into boxes, and have humans at the top of the chain, maybe there's just really kind of just, you know, a sleight of hand that's happening here. I think, you know, it, it unveils the kind of flaws of enlightenment thought. You know, if enlightenment, the age of reason was all about saying, you don't really need to think about what's outside. You need to kind of control it from, you know, basically put human understanding on top of it. I think in this peer, you know, piece, he's suggesting maybe we don't have everything under control. Maybe nature can't be just simply controlled by putting it in a category. And that the later thinkers, right, after the age of the Enlightenment, this early national part, uh, are going to really delve into the romantic aspects of challenging what nature is all about. Um, we're going to see this kind of alluded to at some of the later works, people that you probably know fairly well, like Washington Irving and Edgar Allan Poe a little bit later on. So there is this, you know, in a way, the rejection starts to come, you know, in the early part of the 19th century. You know, all of the kind of... Um, the efforts of the founders like the Franklins and the Jeffersons start to kind of unravel a little bit and they start to become challenged by popular writers. Now, the first popular writer I'm going to tell you about, this is the best seller of the 19th century up until 1845. Has anyone ever heard of Charlotte Temple? Charlotte Temple. All right, so Susanna Rouson was the, was the author of Charlotte Temple, right? And this goes to show you the kind of, you know, kind of concurrence of what's happening in this period. This is a novel, it's called A Sentimental Romance, all right? If you read it right now, and it's had some bit of a, of a, of a renaissance, a, a regrowth, um, and it actually was, a, you know, wildly popular. We're talking about hundreds of editions. In a nutshell, Charlotte Temple is a story of a young girl who was seduced by an army officer in England, and he brings her to the United States. And then what happens? She becomes pregnant with his child, and he abandons her. And in a sentimental way, she learns to accept her fate, that he, she has been abandoned. She has her child. She dies at the, the birth of her child. Americans loved this. They loved it, and they ate it up. They loved melodrama. In fact, the genre, you, know, you, know, you kind of think about it. The two bestsellers that I'm going to talk about, like the ones that kind of really hold Americans' attention. Sentimental romance, gothic, devilish city fiction, the most lurid you can imagine. It shows you the balancing effects that the popular culture had with the leaders. Because think about it, you had these two Enlightenment figures. And in any syllabus, if you're dealing with early American national literature, you're going to have Jefferson and you're going to have Franklin. But there's also this counterbalance. Americans were challenging this notion that the world wasn't based on the intellect. It was based on feeling, right? As a New York story, there is actually a burial slab in Trinity Church. No one knows how it really got there. There's always this speculation. But it has Charlotte Temple on it. And people and the period used to go to cry on the grave site. That's how much the story. And when you read it, you go, all right, we know she's going to die. Uh, we know that she's going to resolve herself to accept her fate and be strong for her child. But, I mean, it really is pot-boiling melodrama. They loved it, right? They ate it up. In fact, I think Trinity Churchyard actually exhumed it to find out who is actually buried here because it's a fictional character, right? What happened? So Susanna Rouson's novel, right, this really popular bestseller, I think is, an, is a challenge to a lot of the you know, reasonable age of enlightenment figures that we saw in the beginning. Appealing more to sympathy, to feeling as opposed to the intellect. Right? So you have that story, and you can't get away from the fact that we also have in this period the beginnings of America has laid to claim the only genre it can actually, I think, claim as, as it's being the origin of this genre, and that's the slave narrative. This is uh, Luda Equiano's or Gustavus Vasa's uh, interesting narrative of the life. I, I mention this because when you think about Rousen's and Equiano's work, both of them become fulfilled in the period in the 1850s, right? In, two, in 1840s, 1850s. Equiano discusses what it was like to be taken from his homeland, to be put on a slave ship, to see the horrors 
of what it was like to be a part of the slave economy. He eventually escapes and gets to England and becomes a very famous abolitionist. But this is the beginnings of a, of a new class of literature in America. I believe the perfection of this, where it really reaches an art, is when you get to the work in 1845 and 1855 of Frederick Douglass, right? where he very consciously writes a narrative that will be emulated for decades and decades. But this is, again, the period where these works start to come to, into fruition. If you think about Rousen's work, I think you find in Rousen's work the fruition of Uncle Tom's Cabin. You know, condescendingly or not, Abraham Lincoln said, well, here's this little lady who started this great big war. Right? The sentimental novel often teaches you in terms of feeling, accept your fate, maybe accept God's will, and take the fact that perhaps this world is an imperfect one. And that's exactly what Uncle Tom's Cabin did in the you know, kind of American Renaissance period, right? We're going to have sacrificial figures who give themselves up for the lives of others. It's very much Christ-like and based on the kind of resurrection. Now, this novel, um, which I've only had one illustration of, I, I point this out because as we thought about the domestic novel and as you kind of contextualize the slave narrative, I think the most important fictional development out of this period is the Gothic novel. Um, it is a period in time where Charles Brockton Brown writes a work called uh, Wyland, right? Not very much read, but extremely influential. And Wyland is a very interesting study in American the cultural dynamics of America. He would inspire Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, he would also inspire George Lepard, who I'll talk about a little bit later. In this work, just to briefly summarize, because I'm sure no one has probably ever heard of it or read it, it tells the story of two intersecting um, siblings, the Pliles and the Wylands. They live in relative exclusion in Pennsylvania. They live almost in a world of themselves. Pliel is a rationalist, an Enlightenment thinker, right? Wants to use the Age of Enlightenment to kind of like think through how to, how to function in the world. Wyland is a religious fanatic. He wants to create his own kind of brand of religion. And his father, very mysteriously, in this temple that's been created on their estate, actually like spontaneously combusts. What Brockton Brown was interested in is these two parallels of American identity. You had this rationalistic side. You also had this religious utopian side and how they come together. And in one of it's an allegory for these two competing interests kind of clashing. So you have two siblings, you know, kind of intermarried. You know, one brother marries a sister and so on and so forth. And they live in perfect harmony until one very strange event occurs. Out of nowhere, a guy named Carwin the Billoquist. Anyone know what a Billoquist does? Billoquist. Carwin the Billoquist is someone who can throw his voice. So this mysterious character, who you don't really know his origins, comes into this perfect utopian world. And all of a sudden, Theodore Wyland begins to hear voices. What do those voices tell him? They tell him eventually to murder his wife. And all of a sudden, everything is thrown out of order, right? You have this really dark Gothicism that comes in. And then you have Carwin, who, when he's confronted, goes, well, yeah, I was playing a trick on everyone and throwing my voice, but I never told Theodore to kill his wife. I didn't do it. What Brockton Brown is playing with is, hey, maybe we don't know as much as we think we do. Maybe we need to question the religious utopia fanaticism that we have where people kind of create their own religion apart from themselves and they begin to hear voices to t that God tells them in a kind of Old Testament prophecy, you know, almost like Abraham and Isaac, kill your son, this is what I've said to do. Brockton Brown is saying, which voices do you listen to? And that's going to become a very interesting preoccupation for the writers that follow. Brockton Brown is a direct, you know, kind of influence on Edgar Allan Poe. We all, you know, know about Poe's kind of experimentations with the psychology of the, the doppelganger. A lot of it comes from here. And this novel is a question about how do you rectify a culture that in one sense has religious fanaticism. You know, we've seen that, you know, this kind of utopian experiments. And yet it also at times says it's based on reason and knowledge. When those things collide, 
everything kind of explodes. Now, this figure um, is, I think, in various ways, when you think about the ending of your course, here's someone who initially changes. And I would say, you know, if I was going to make the case, this is where the, the literary independence of America takes shape. 1819, 1820, a fellow New Yorker named Washington Irving begins to create the first truly international reputation for an American author. You know, as the scientists are saying, hey, everything degenerates there, the cultural critics are also saying, who in God's name would read an American book? Why bother? And this is the first time that people internationally say, oh, wow, maybe we should pay attention. And I believe there's something very interesting that gets situated here. So the sketchbook comes out in 1819, 1820. And most of that, that book is a lot about its picaresque, as travel sense, it gives a lot of society gossip. But the two stories that stand out, right, that are, have probably infiltrated all of your childhoods at some point, Rip Van Winkle and The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Now think about when you're talking about a country that doesn't have a national myth, doesn't have a sense, a built-in sense of heroes. And that's not to say that people didn't try. I mean, remember, at this period in time, there are several writers that have kind of fallen into histories like kind of like darkness of like the Joel Barlows and others of that ilk who are trying consciously to create an American epic, a hero out of like Homer or Milton, right, that rises up out of democracy. None of it really sticks. But this is the first time that really kind of enters a cultural consciousness. Think about what Rip suggests, though. Here's a character that does what? Remember, you're Rip Van Winkle. What does Rip do? He sleeps. Rip Van Winkle sleeps, sleeps, sleep, right? Think about part of what it suggests. He goes, follows his dog, and sees a troll going up the mountain, and he eventually has this kind of, well, uh, vision of some sort that he's drinking a keg of beer with the followers of Henry Hudson. So this is this imaginative, you know, an imaginative kind of recasting. Irving was fascinated with the past. Irving was fascinated with, maybe we can't escape it so readily. But it also gives you a sense, too, of what would become a very quintessential American feature. Why is Rip Van Winkle going up into the mountains? He wants to escape Dame Van Winkle. He wants to not do duties of the house. He wants to get away from that. He wants to hang out with the guys at the tavern. He could do other people's work, but he's not going to take care of his own business. He goes up, RIP, rest in peace, I'd say, goes up, has this slumber, and comes back and realizes that the world has been turned upside down, that all that he knew has gone and the world has gone on beyond him. It's a, a kind of beginning, though, of an American myth. American narratives love the story of venturing out on your own, escaping the known, escaping the domestic, and going off into a world of your own creation. Huck Finn, clearly, Melville, Right? They all seemingly revolve. Even you know, the contemporary of Irving, James Fenimore Cooper, up in you know, the, the grand you know, Cooperstown, who was named after, has all of these novels about two characters venturing off into this world and kind of escaping the, the kind of hypocrisies of the known world. What's interesting here with Rip is this notion that here is this character who returns and then has to kind of go back and begin to recapitulate the past, return to a historical memory. The other really important story out of that is the Headless Horseman. Think about what that story pits together. You have Ichabod Crane. In Hebrew, Ichabod is the inglorious one. Ichabod Crane is a pioneersman, an intellect who comes to teach the school children up in Tarrytown, right? Who does he run into and clash with? Brom Bones kind of based upon Abraham. And think about what that sets in motion. You have Ichabod Crane, who believes very firmly in things like witchcraft, Cotton Mather, the Puritan past, ghosts. And what gets used against him? Well, you'd probably say that Brom Bones, the anti-intellectual tough guy, uses his own imagination against him by creating a headless horseman. The shift is very important, though, folks. Think about this. 
It's a headless horseman. No more reason, right? This is the period in time where American authors increasingly reject enlightenment values. We're not guided by intellectual principles. Sometimes we're guided by strength and power and fear, right? What's interesting about the work is Irving kind of gives you a hands-off, right? Because he creates an Ichabod Crane, a character that comes in, and the first thing that he wants to do is he sees these gorgeous farms, and the only thing he can think about is turning them all into cash, eating all the fruits of the land, right? Taking everything for himself. So there's an ambiguity. And that becomes the, the kind of, when we shift into the, the latter part of the 1820s and 1830s, there's an increasing turn to ambiguity, uh, darkness, and romanticism. That maybe, you know, reason has its limits. And that maybe we, are, we believe more in sentiment and feeling than we would let on. Now, the last figure that I'm just going to talk about before we turn it over to questions is, of course, Edgar Allan Poe. Um, I always keep Poe, um, I put Poe in conversation with the, before Uncle Tom's Cabin, the greatest bestseller, you know, you had Charlotte Temple, was, you know, early on in American literature, up until 1845. Uh, George Lepard's Quaker City became the runaway bestseller for many, for about a decade, until Uncle Tom's Cabin. Quaker City, um, Lepard and Poe were very close friends. In fact, Lepard had actually saved Poe a couple of times. They were really close intimates. Quaker City is a kind of muckraker novel. It's about exposing the hypocrisy of capitalism, right? It shows you Philadelphia. Basically, it's a story of you have these really well-to-do bankers and businessmen are going about their days, and what do they do at night? Well, they escape into Monk Hall, and Monk Hall is a place of hedonism, opium, drugs, uh, abductions, uh, lustful desires. Lippard was interested in a sense of the subconscious of the city. People loved it, right? Because it exposed this idea of, well, you have these people who live, you know, up, you know, basically morally, you know, upright, you know, uh, world, you know, lives in the daytime, but at night they sneak into this vice that they're basically feeding off of everyone else and exposing them. So Lippard and Poe are very close kind of friends. When you think about Poe's contribution in the 1840s, right, this sets off, I think, a change that's going to be really important for the culture. The Raven became very popular. Quote the Raven, nevermore. Think about what it, it suggests. In that poem, which Poe had to recite dozens and dozens and dozens of times, became very popular even among school children. The Raven sits atop a bust, right? A bust that seems to represent logic and order. The Raven, this ominous sign, comes from some other place. What he says, the Boutonian shore, and rests right atop this bus, suggesting maybe that we're not perhaps guided by the world of reason and, and, and logic. Maybe we're guided by impulses. Maybe we're guided by our own darker psychology. Maybe we're you know, kind of fueled by a sense of loss, right, rather than being able to kind of like mindfully control the things in our world. Um, I often think, you know, this period of, of literature gets overlooked because of what followed it. You know, when we started with Franklin, uh, one work that I think, for those of you who are, I'm sure, have read this work, when you read Franklin, if you read Franklin's work and you see that checklist, uh, never forget uh, the great American novel the 20, of the 1920s, The Great Gatsby. All right? You think about that, what happens at the end of The Great Gatsby, after all the disaster? You find out Nick Haraway finds his friend, right? And he finds that he's been taking this notebook, right? kind of scratching in his kind of list. Think about what Jay Gatsby does in that book and what Fitzgerald points out is maybe the flaw that begins our discussion. If it's all about moral perfectibility, being in charge, think about what the great Gatsby entails. It starts with a man who wants to become somebody else. It's very American. Poor boy, wants to become Jay Gatsby. He's actually James Gatz. And in his notebooks, he shows you, like Franklin, him trying to get better. Except what does that novel entail? You can't repeat the past, right? It comes back really kind of violently to haunt him that casting off your identity and trying to become someone, someone else has dramatic consequences. 
And in a way, when you think about the ending, when we turn to like the period right after the early national period, it's often termed the American Renaissance or American Romanticism. This is a period where the darker shadows, the darker thoughts in American culture start to bubble up. Right? The Poes and the Hawthorns kind of have this kind of lingering doubt that you can't just control your destiny and become whoever you want, that maybe there are other forces working. I'll leave you with just a simple idea of, you know, right after Poe's kind of incorporation of, you know, the doppelganger and also the sense that we're, we're kind of more so controlled by our thoughts rather than simply our, our deeds. Two really important works follow this period. Uh, I would say if I was going to claim what, you know, would be the, the American epics, um, in 1851, 1855, in a, in a four-year span, you have Moby Dick written by Herman Melville, Right? A disastrous story about Ahab trying to you know, find the white whale and bringing everyone down with the ship. And the only one who's the survivor is, is Ishmael, the one who lives to tell the tale. The college student who's able to kind of perhaps take and, and, and give and kind of keep an open mind. And the one that I, you know, of course, that many of you know that I, is, has a near and dear um, place in my heart is Whitman's Song of Myself, the Brooklynite who writes, in a sense, in, a, in an embracing way that all people, he goes back to individualism, but yet he has an open arm to say that it, it, this is individualism for everybody. And it's not just simply about you know, tr someone trying to control an audience and, and kind of manipulate them. That Whitman's individualism is much more, um, in a sense, transcendental and optimistic rather than Franklin's control. So uh, really appreciated talking to all of you. If you have questions. You know, the, the great thing about Franklin's autobiography, it's, it, it's a little bit of both. You know, I, I think the, the interesting thing about reception is that a lot of people read it in the time period as this is the, the how to succeed in business. And what's so great about it is when you read it really, you know, he's really humorous. I mean, he's giving you a sense of like, I'm, I'm kind of joking. Don't, don't take most of what I say seriously. But people really ate it up. They were like, well, I can do this too. Um, but all throughout, even that, that list that I showed you. I mean, he's laughing at himself and saying, you know, like almost wink, wink. Yeah, kind of follow these things, but also, you know, uh, maybe uh, take it a little bit with a grain of salt. I think, well, let, uh, a pass is a really interesting figure in a sense. If you ever get the chance, um, one of the, 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 the stories that kind of gets pushed to the side, his uh, Son of the Forest is a really interesting memoir about what the Native American experience, what, kind of like the slave narrative. That was the first um, you know, Native American autobiography that kind of gained some traction. And what Apes was doing was he was a preacher. Uh, he was kind of an alcoholic, and he was kind of converted to Christianity. But he was writing in a period where, you know, the, in the, the, the winds of the time, it's the, the time of the Indian removal. And what he was trying to do was to suggest, you know, Christianity isn't simply for the chosen. It's for everybody. And he would, the order, you know, his memoir, somewhat like a slave narrow, was trying to suggest, you know, we have just amount of a place here as anyone else. That power doesn't necessarily, you know, make you kind of push to the margins. And it's a really, in a sense, a very powerful work. Some of his other ones, too, where he kind of, he champions uh, uh, lost Native American tribesmen who refuse to relent and just simply give up their land and kind of be pushed aside. Uh, Pess is a kind of, you know, I think the first writer, a Native American writer of uh, real note. And his memoir is really worth everyone's attention. Bellow is just someone that I wrote about years, you know, many years later. Uh, totally different. Uh, but, you know, here was someone, you know, if, if you ever want a chance to read a, a really short but kind of profound uh, book, I always recommend Saul Bellow's Seize the Day. Very, very sh interesting work. I mean, I teach Saul Bellow when I teach American Nobel laureates. And Saul Bellow was really concerned out of the University of Chicago, kind of reestablishing a sense of, you know, like w classics of Western civilization. And that work for me is profound because it tells one story of one day of this character named Tommy Wilhelm, who is struggling to try and make it like everybody else, He's trying to, you know, make it big in the market, and he keeps failing, he keeps on being taken by charlatans. And the story has this very profound ending where he's, he's been frazzled by this Dr. T uh, uh, Dr. Tamkin or Tamkin? Dr. Tamkin. Dr. Tamkin has basically swindled him out of some money because he wants to kind of have a quick make it fix. And he's trying to track him down. And as he goes to track him down, he comes across a funeral. And for whatever reason, he winds up going and following into the funeral home and starts 
kind of bawling hysterically. And the people are like, oh, they must, he must have known them, you know, really well. And it turns out it's just a, a feeling of sympathy of, of seize the day as kind of understanding, you know, human frailty and, and, and the limits that we have. And finally getting that realization, almost like an epiphanic moment of, you know, the, the, the pathway towards, you know, all of this, you know, kind of, you know, trying to make it eventually leads to the same place. It's really a pretty good work. I'm not a fan of Ayn Rand, but I, I do, I mean, I understand, you know, the, 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 the fascination with, with, with some of her philosophies. I, I do think it's going to be, a, it's always a perpetual question, right? I mean, it's a question in our arts, it's a question in our politics, it's a question everywhere. You know, and it's a question, I think, you know, that, hey, we as citizens are always struggling to understand. You know, which one leads to a greater truth? Right? Is it, is it things that you intuitively feel, or is it, you know, the, the thought process goes on? I mean, the reason why I point out this period is it's just, it was so evident of the fight back and forth and what was popular and what was not. But it, it also kind of, the subtext of it has a lot to do with power constructions. You know, that those who were in power obviously use reason quite to their advantage to shape the conversation. Whereas what was seemingly more interesting in the public was appeals to common, you know, you know uh, common brotherhood, right? That we have kind of shared feelings and emotions and perhaps feelings of inadequacy. And, you know, hey, I, I don't think a lot has changed in that. When you think about the two, you know, the biggest bestsellers of this period, we probably look to the same thing here, right? What do people want to read? Uh, sometimes they want to be escorted to kind of, you know, suffer through a good melodrama, right? Suffer along even though you know how it's going to end up. Or you like lurid kind of, you know, dark and almost like, you know, you know, Stephen King kind of escapism. And that's what, in a sense, the, you know, the writing of something like a George Lepart kind of brings out, that we're really kind of based upon these undercurrents that we're not really fully aware of. It's, it's left to question what his intentions are. I think he's what, you know, he falls into this line in America of the trickster, who comes along and basically, with mysterious purposes, just upsets the apple cart. You know, he has this ability, this magical ability to come in and, and kind of throw off these two polarizing forces and do disastrous consequences, and yet at the same time going, I, I didn't do it. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I'm just, you know. But, you know, Brockton Brown's novel, well, not beautifully written, because it was written really fast, um, that character always entertained a lot of people because you're, you're left saying, Does, he's lying about his origins. They take him in. Why? Are they asking? I mean, it's almost like, you know, he's asking a question that Poe would come back to. Are they asking for trouble, right? It's not an accident that that novel focuses on, you know, a pair of brothers and sisters marrying a brothers and sisters. It was a theme that Poe loved. Poe loved, like, those crossing figures where you're like, are they all the same? You know, if you ever read The Fall of the House of Usher, there's a certain point where you go, wait a minute, are the brother and sister really one? I always play this, this trick with students, too. When I ever I teach that work, here's my moment of, like, you know, like, ooh. I always put up The Fall of the House of Usher. And then I separate and draw a line between S and H. Is it the fall of the house of us and her? Is the narrator linked to the brother? Are they basically kind of entombing the sister, and the sister comes up out of the grave to get them? I mean, Poe was a master at, like, psychology before you can even name it. You know, before you had Freud, he's discussing things that are well in advance of his time. You know, so be it. That's how, that's oftentimes, how great psychological or discoveries are made is that the, the writers kind of tap into something well in advance, and then we kind of catch up with the theory. I always look at all of Franklin's political writings as, as here was someone, and I, no politics aside, love him or hate him, Trump is able to use Twitter to do a lot of things. Ben Franklin was able to use the pamphlet to do much of the same thing. He was able to use the medium to change and channel direction. Right? And use, I mean, in a way, use of, well, you know, taking on this identity, the pseudonym, right? I'm able to kind of deflect the idea that, well, it's not me, it's that person, it's this, you know, person telling the story, but yet at the same time, through those pamphlets, to really change the, the minds and hearts of people to your will and desire. Um, there's, a, there's a great book about it uh, by a scholar named Michael Warner, who's at Rutgers, that really deals with the sense of how a lot of these writers understood the nature of the technology of print. And they knew that print was the way that you were eventually going to get your policies out there. So poor Richard is the classic example of that. Right? Being able to take the medium and basically quick dissemination and get people to kind of start leaning 
So it's, well, maybe we do need uh, to have uh, some representation, you know, if we're going to be taxed. Uh, I'll just put it out there for you. And then, you know, what's great about that is the maxims in all those works then became part and parcel with a kind of American sense of self, which is kind of, you know, it's interesting to see how he was able to kind of almost create a national type without even trying too hard. I, I mean, I think, you know, in the beginning, there's, there's no question that the early founders uh, were driven by, you know, enlightened and rational, you know, rational enlightenment perspectives. Uh, and they were, they were sort of, in a sense, um, trying to see as an experiment whether you could take, you know, um, those principles and apply them to law. I, I, you know, that, I, it's, a, it's, you know, they protested, I think, too much in the early period that they were so original. Um, even when Jefferson is writing back and forth to Buffon in France, there is a sense of an inferiority complex that they're, they're sort of kind of treading on the ideas of, you know, from generations before. And, you know, in terms of like the period where we leave off, American Romanticism, American Romanticism wouldn't have existed without particularly German and British Romanticism, right? This idea, you know, like that you would go deeper into nature, that you would rely more on intuition, right? And you would rely more on perhaps, um, um, an ambiguity to the world that wasn't present prior to that. I think a lot of that comes, you know, regardless, a lot of it comes from people like William Wordsworth. You know, that you're, you're looking to have an overflowing of feeling uh, in nature. And you want to try to get away from the city and from the kind of, the, the kind of gridded nature of what the city entails, the order of the city, in order to have a higher spiritual uh, transformation. You know, I didn't mention it, but you know, the, the backdrop you know, in the, the last part, like the 1840s, um, when America is again deciding you know, philosophically what it will be like, I often think that America comes down to two interesting poles. Right? You come down to the transcendentalists, people like you know, Ralph Waldo Emerson, who would inspire Thoreau and inspire Whitman. I mean, they were looking, in a sense, to go into nature to find God, to find spirituality, right? to find society. In, in as simplest terms as possible. And there was an optimism that individually you could do that, right? If you got away and you kind of listened to nature, you would be able to find something trans, you know, transcendent. Uh, you could tap into an oversoul that would connect all of us. Um, when you think about the, the, the flip side, the darker romantic side, um, I think the Melvilles and the Hawthorns, in going into nature, y you often worry about, well, where that could pull you in a negative way. You know, Moby Dick is the great example of it. What happens if, if a ship of state is run by someone's vengeance and you go out to conquer this force? It can have terrifying consequences, right? And it's, you know, this is 1851, right, at the tail of this. I mean, Melville was, I think, directly responding to this notion of, hey, we, if we don't pay attention, we could easily fall victim to this. That, that ship, that whale ship that's going out to make tons of money and make America an, an imperial power, if it's led by the wrong person, so there is that sense in this polarity that runs throughout this kind of period between the darkness and the light, right? Of people who are really optimistic and think, yeah, we can do this and just go into yourself again and, and follow your, the trust yourself and don't trust others. And then there's others who have a very darker sense that, um, Maybe we have to be careful of who we listen to. I mean, the reason why Carwin gets brought up, I think, is there is that sense in the, in the Brockton Browns and the pose of how do you know you're listening to the right voice? Carwin. Carwin. C-A-R-W-I-N. He actually writes another work about that as well. It's Carwin the Biloquist. It's actually a subtext of it. But yeah, he's, he's interested and worried about, you know, if we, we simply believe you follow yourself, Right? If that's what America is, is touting from its origins, that's the national hero. M maybe it could easily be led, as led astray. Uh, it could be easily led astray by perhaps darker impulses to avoid, uh, avoid the world. The work that comes directly after Equianos is, I, I think, the, the, you know, there, are two, there are a couple that really come out. Um, the Douglas narrative is, is, is the best example, 1845 and 1850, 1845 and 1855. For me, are the most, with Harriet Jacobs' 1861 incidents in the life of the slave girl, these are the classic examples of the slave narrative. Um, the reason why I think Douglas stands out for me more so than any is that you see an author take shape. Uh, you see, in 1845, it's a very raw kind of, you know, he, he talks about, like, you know, 
kind of getting children to help him to learn how to read. And there's a wonderful scene that if you look at it as a comparison, where he has this fight with the slave breaker Covey. And in 1845, it's, it's clear that Douglas wants to suggest he had no choice. This man is trying to kill me. He's trying to break my body. I've got to fight back. Ten years later, the change in the title means everything. Um, it goes from you know, the, auto, you know, the, the, the narrative of Frederick Douglass, an American slave, to my bondage and my freedom. And it's really interesting because in 10 years' time, he said, this isn't your narrative. right? Because slave narratives were very focused on form. You know, I wrote this. Here's the incidents. These are the horrors. This is really what happened. But by the time he gets 10 years later, he's become very self-conscious about this struggle is really mine. This isn't about a slave narrative to be used in the abolitionist circles to kind of you know, get me to think and feel about what it was like to be a slave. It's more so in 1855 that he's saying, I knew exactly what I was doing. And when Covey comes after me, I know that if I break him, he's done. And I have him in my powers the whole time. It's a masterful shift in narrative. And I, you know, in a way, you know, as, as dark as it sounds, it's one of those few genres that America can say, you know, kind of lay claim to as being one of its origins. Everything else is derivative, but uh, ironically, the slave narrative is something that developed here. Um, and I think Douglas is the ultimate master of, of, of that genre. Well, you've got a really interesting period of time to kind of think about and contemplate, some of which I think, uh, you know, when, we, when you leave off and you kind of you move on in this course, the 1850s for me, for those who are fans of American literature and its development, uh, that's the place where I think you, know, you really, there's a five year period where if you think about 1850, you have the publication of the Scarlet Letter. 51, Moby Dick. 55, you have Douglas's second autobiography and you have Whitman's Song of Myself. I mean, it's like, you know, there it is. Where, you know, for this period of time that we've talked about, America's trying to figure it out. How do we, you know, what makes us unique does the culture degenerate? How do you think about what makes someone uniquely American? And this is the kind of formation period where we start to make decisions as to what constitutes an American cultural identity. And I think that's why it makes it so interesting. So I really appreciate you having me come and talk. Thanks again.